All right, thanks very much for that introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Felix. I'm a software engineer at Tecton. And today I will be talking to you about managing your data infrastructure with Feast. So first of all, what is Feast? Feast is an open source feature store. We entered the Linux Foundation for AI in September of 2020, and we've really seen a tremendous amount of growth since then. We're now an active community with 3,000 plus members on Slack and bi-weekly community calls, which I would encourage you to stop by it if you have the time. And we've also seen a lot of contributions from a wide range of tech companies such as Twitter, Shopify, Robinhood, Salesforce, Gojek, IBM, and of course, Tekton as well. And you can see a bunch of other logos down below of teams that are either running or contributing to Feast. So now let's take a quick look at the architecture of Feast. We really have a strong focus on the cloud native and the serverless experience. So Feast works extremely well with data warehouses such as BigQuery, Redshift, and of course, Snowflake, as Miles just talked about in the previous lightning talk. We also aim to be extremely modular and extensible, and we have connectors to AWS, GCP, Azure, Snowflake, Redis, Hive, and a few more that are on the way. And I really wanna emphasize the fact here that Feast is extremely extensible. And this is because we have a few core abstractions, such as an offline store and an online store, which make it really easy for folks to just plug into and write their own connectors. And I think the Snowflake example is actually a great example right there, where because we expose these uh, offline store and online store abstractions, Miles was really easily able to just write this plugin and then merge it into the main Feast repo. And so in general, we found that these abstractions make it very easy for contributors to come by, run Feast with whatever custom stack they have, and also contribute whatever connectors they write back to the community and merge that into our main repo. So we've, we've really seen a lot of success there. And finally, we don't need to dive into too much detail, I think, since we've talked a lot about feature stores today. But as you can see from the center of this diagram, Feast has you know, all the standard functionality of a feature store. We store your features for you. We uh, transform and execute transformations. We serve those features as well. We recently added data quality monitoring capabilities. So this allows you to examine your training data sets, your data during serving time, and also check for training serving skew to make sure your models aren't going to go haywire due to some training serving skew. And of course, Feast also allows you to register and discover uh, your features in some central repository, which makes collaboration super easy for data scientists. So all the standard functionality for a feature store. Diving a little more deeply into the data infrastructure, and I'm sure most of you folks are very familiar with this, there's really two core flows when it comes to Feast and feature stores in general. The first is this offline flow, which is represented by the bottom half of this diagram, where a user, typically a data scientist, will use Feast to query the offline store, and that will yield some kind of data frame, which will, they'll plug into some training algorithm, and that will yield some model, which will then end up being put into some application in production. And this is typically done in a notebook, probably. The second flow is the online flow, where users will first materialize features from the offline store into some kind of low latency online store, and then they'll retrieve features from the online store, serve those features to the model in production, which will then power some kind of prediction. And so zooming even a little bit more into this online serving flow, as I was just talking about, uh, Feast will materialize those features for you from the offline store. As I mentioned, that's typically BigQuery, Redshift, Snowflake into an online store, which we most commonly see Redis and also DynamoDB and Data Store being used. In terms of how features are actually being retrieved from the online store, we have a whole bunch of different options. We have the Python SDK, which you can use, a Python server, as well as a Java server for folks who are a lot more uh, latency sensitive. We also have published a bunch of benchmarks around those servers. So if you're curious about you know, what kind of latency uh, requirements uh, we meet, you can definitely go check out that blog post, which I can link to later on. And finally, if you don't really want to run or uh, yeah, maintain your own servers, Feast also has this option to set up an AWS Lambda. And so if you just plug a few lines of configuration into Feast, we will just spin up that AWS Lambda for you. And it should be super easy for you to get up and running with the feature store and serving uh, features to models in production in just a few minutes. And we'll actually go into example workflow in just a couple moments, which talks about the AWS Lambda in more detail. So moving on to the next section, let's talk about how Feast actually manages your data infrastructure and then walk through a quick example to show you in more detail. So there's two really central things that Feast needs. Uh, the first is some declarative definitions of your features and transformations, data sources, et cetera. We refer to that as a feature repository. Uh, 
And the second is a central configuration file, which we've named by default feature store.yaml. And of course, it's a YAML configuration file. The figure you see on the left here is basically illustrating an example feature store.yaml file. So why don't we take a look at this and see what's going on? So you see a project, which is a feast project, which is basically scoping all the feature definitions to allow data scientists to collaborate within that project. We have a registry, which is what stores all those feature definitions and associated metadata. So you can see that's basically just a file on S3. And in the third line, you see that we've denoted we're using AWS as a provider. And the provider is really just an abstraction which wraps the offline store and the online store. And so if you choose AWS as a provider, that means by default, we'll use Redshift as your offline store and DynamoDB as your online store. And so that's why you see you know, this US West 2 uh, in, as the region for online store, of course, you have to specify that for DynamoDB. And then you also have to specify these things like your cluster ID, your user, your database, et cetera, for Redshift. And finally, in the last three lines, you'll see we have this feature server uh, area and we've set to enable to be true. And what this means is you're telling Feast, look, I would like Feast to just spin up this AWS Lambda, launch that for me, and then you should be really easily able to query features from that. And so basically the way Feast works is, you know, in terms of managing your data infrastructure is you plug in this uh, feature store.yaml, your feature definitions. And then once you, you know, uh, run Feast apply, the command, which I'll talk about in the next slide, Feast ends up configuring this infrastructure for you, which in this case is two different things. One is DynamoDB and the second is AWS Lambda. In terms of what tables are actually getting constructed in DynamoDB, that depends on the actual feature definitions that you make, but that's not a thing you have to think about. Feast will basically configure all of those under the hood so that we can serve the features at low latency and you don't really have to worry about that. So in terms of launching your infrastructure, there's two main commands to uh, be concerned about. The first is Feast plan and the second is Feast apply. Of course, these are basically analogous to what you would find in Terraform. Plan will show you a preview of the changes to be made and apply will actually uh, apply those changes. And so in this case, you can see the output of a feast apply command. Maybe what you did was you defined an entity in a feature view. And so you see that feast is telling you we created an entity in a feature view. And then because you created that feature view, feast will, al will also create a DynamoDB table that corresponds to that feature view, uh, which you can see right there as well. So now that we've covered you know, what it might look like to uh, launch some data infrastructure, let's go through an example really quickly. So if you're a data scientist, you want to use Feast, probably the first thing you might do is to find some uh, data sources. And so you see here, there's a Redshift source for your driver statistics, say, and also another Redshift source for some user statistics. You can see that we've pointed those two sources at respective tables called driver hourly stats and user stats. And you also define two entities called a driver and a user. The image on the left is a schema, which might represent the data in say your driver hourly stats table. And you can see here, there's five columns. Uh, you have an event timestamp column, which is of course a timestamp indicating, you know, when this feature was recorded, a driver ID column indicating what driver this uh, row refers to, and then three actual feature values, a conversion rate, an accuracy rate, and some average daily trips. So now that you've defined uh, these data sources and these entities, your next step is probably going to be to define some feature views, which package these features together. So if you take a look at the feature view on the left, you'll see it's given a name, the entity, which refers to the driver. You define the three features, which are precisely what we just covered. And then finally, you point your batch data source at uh, the table, the redshift source we just defined. And so from there, you're basically good to go. You can plug in the feature store.yaml file from a few slides ago. And just to go back, that looks like this. You know, you basically just configure your stuff with AWS. And then once you run Feast Apply, we tell you we created two entities, created two feature views, created uh, two DynamoDB tables, and also launched that AWS Lambda feature server for you. And so at that point, you're basically good to go. So that in a nutshell is how Feast might manage your data infrastructure. And finally, really briefly, I just wanted to touch on how Feast might fit into a CICD context. So today, most ML teams will version their features with Git. And so what will happen is a data scientist will create a PR. And then once that PR is merged in, CICD will typically run Feast Apply, which will you know, uh, construct that feature in Feast as well as update any infrastructure that's necessary. And another thing we've recently started recommending to users is you can actually make this process even more reliable by running Feast plan on every PR. And so you can you know, have some GitHub actions bot, some workflow, which every single time a PR is run, it'll automatically run 
uh, feast plan, it'll show you the expected changes to be made. So you can see here, if you add a feature view, the expected changes are going to be a new feature view and a new DynamoDB table. And that way, it's really clear to both the data scientist and, say, the ML engineer who's reviewing this PR exactly what infrastructure changes are going to take place. And so this makes your CI/CD a whole lot more reliable. It should eliminate any kind of you know, weird flukes where you accidentally delete, say, a DynamoDB table that's serving some model in production. Um, and yeah, that's how Feast and CICD might work together. So that's it. That's the end of my talk. And thank you very much for listening. Awesome, man. So there's a few questions coming through in the chat. I am going to ask that you ask these questions in the Slack channel, but I'll ask one that I saw coming through in Zoom because it's a really good one for you, Felix. Does the online store only get updated via materializations from the offline store or can updates be streamed from other upstream systems? That is a great question. And in fact, that's actually one of the things that our team is really starting to focus on. We've had a lot of requests for basically being able to write directly from streams and ingest into the online store. And this is currently being worked on. We support it for Redis as an online store right now, but we're planning to support it for all the other online stores coming soon. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a, one of the top priorities for our team right now. 